But what if you defer taxes and A, you're more successful in the future? If anyone's told you you're gonna be in a lower tax bracket in the future, don't listen to that. Why would you wanna have less money in the future? Here's the two tax traps that most people fall victim to. Number one, deferring tax. Okay, my great-grandfather left Italy. He lived in San Giovanni in Fiore, and in 1913, he left Italy because he literally couldn't put food on the table. That's where the mob was really born, was down in that area, and they were taking a bunch of his profits, and the government was taking his profits, so he left his pregnant wife to be able to go to America and start earning money. It took him seven years to leave the tent that he lived in and buy a home and become, of all things, a coal miner and bring his family out. Now, ironically, 1913 was the same year that the U.S. created the Revenue Code, which was the IRS and taxing people. It was going to be this temporary thing, by the way. It hasn't felt too temporary. But what if you defer your taxes into a future where taxes go up? Now, I can't tell you they're going to go up. I'm just telling you, in the U.S. alone, there's $21 trillion of, of debt. And typically, the government raises money by taxation, not by producing goods and services, right? So what if you defer taxes and A, you're more successful in the future? If anyone's told you you're gonna be in a lower tax bracket in the future, don't listen to that. Why would you wanna have less money in the future? Stop listening to everything Ryan's teaching you if you wanna be broke in the future and have a lower tax, right? You're gonna have more taxes in the future just because of inflation alone. You're gonna have more money and it's gonna take more money to buy the same things that it takes to buy today, which means you're gonna get hit with more taxes. So unless you're gonna have more tax deductions, I mean, Mick Jagger just had a kid recently, so I guess he can write that off on his taxes, but most of us when we're at that age, we're not having more kids. That's a confusing lineage, by the way, because like the baby is a grandfather for someone that's you know 40 years older. I, I, can't get, I, I can't wrap my mind around it, but so. I think this song's true, he can't get no satisfaction. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mainly because kids zero to four are romance and sleep terrorists. Let's just face it, you know, that's part of their nature. Love them, but yeah. Okay, so let's talk about these four pieces. Like deferring is a problem because you might be in a higher tax bracket and spending just in the name of saving tax doesn't make sense either. Why would you ever wanna spend a dollar to save 37 and a half cents? I tried it once, I mean, when I was early on in my life, I just got married, my wife had this little red infinity car that she loved, I'm like, babe, I got a great idea. We got this big tax bill coming, what we're gonna do is we're gonna buy an SUV. She's like, we don't have any kids or any, we don't go to the mountains, you just work all the time. I was in the play to win methodology back then. I was like, yeah, but we're gonna get to write it off through this obscure thing called section 179 because it's over 5,500 pounds and it's like an old farmer's rule that now we can write this off. And so we did, we bought a depreciating asset by writing it off that year and ended up spending a dollar to save 37 cents. How genius was that? She didn't even want it. She was like, but isn't a car depreciated? I'm like, I'm the financial genius here, just listen, okay? I've learned to listen. <laughs> so don't just spend to save and don't just defer. Instead, use these four things. So how do we reclassify? The type of corporation you choose absolutely matters. If you're a single member LLC, you're probably overpaying on tax. Even having a 1% partner in there makes a difference. Choosing an S election makes a difference. An S election allows you to take a reasonable salary. Reasonable isn't what you're worth, it's what someone else would be paid. And take the rest in distributions, and distributions save you up to 15.3% of tax. I got a fan here that's completely agreeing with me. Sweet, you got some good people in the room, so yeah. The S election would allow you to do that or an S corporation, right? Or if you have like a, a new product coming out that isn't gonna be massive or you wanna launch things, a C corporation has lower tax on the first $50,000. So choosing that type of thing and classifying your income. Here's another example of reclassification. You all have intellectual property. Are you collapsing all your intellectual property in your one main company? Because you can separate it out into a, in a different company and get paid in licensee fees or royalty fees and have less tax on it. That would be another example of reclassification. Or I have a, this isn't my normal clientele, but I have a rapper who's a client, really famous, like, you know, and I made him go through the same channels everyone else did, and he came to one of our workshops, and he was complaining about how rappers, a lot of times, they're paying for a lot of their own video production and a lot of the clothes that they buy. And I'm not sure if they wear the clothes in their videos out to everyday life, but he doesn't. <laughs> 
okay? So he's like, yeah, my accountant says I can't write that off. And when you look in the code, it says uniforms, if they can be worn in everyday life, can't be written off. But I go, how is it that Hollywood's writing all this off? Because Hollywood's buying stuff all the time that people could wear out every day. Well, the bottom line for Hollywood is they have production companies. So as soon as he set up a production company, he can now write off all those things when he buys it through there. That's reclassification. So reclassification is a game changer. So how do we take ordinary income, which is taxed higher than capital gains? Well, by owning a business, just by doing that, the equity you build in your business, if you ever sell a part or all of that, that's capital gains. That's gonna lower your taxes. Let's say you're facing a ton of risk. You can set up your own insurance company, put money in pre-tax to that company, and then if you don't have the insurance claim, you get to take that out as a capital gain. So there's just, I just want you to wrap your head around the possibilities. Candidly, I'm gonna make sure you have tons of resources because I want you to make sure that you're not wasting money, that you keep a lot more of what you make. But I'm planting the seeds right now so you know what's possible, right? The third category was taxable to tax-free. There's a couple ways to do this. Let's say that you want to sell your business, but you're afraid to just sell it to anyone because if you sell it out there in the world, they might not do it the same way you do it. They might not care about it the same way. We hear about this all the time. You can actually do what's called an ESOP, Employee Stock Option Program, where you could sell your business to your employees. The banks will even finance it for them on the purchase, and you don't pay tax on the stock that they buy, right? Or even better, Let's say you have a charitable inclination and you have any highly appreciated asset like real estate or a business or a stock. You can donate it to what's called a charitable trust. Now, this blows my mind because usually when you sell your business, you pay tax and you have what's left over. If you decide to use a charitable trust, you donate it to a charitable trust of a charity that you love. Then when it sells, you pay no tax. But when you donated it, they gave you a proportionate tax deduction so you got a deduction and no tax, and then you can take income out of that trust for up to 5% of money that's in there, up to 50% depending on the performance because you're the first one to benefit. The charity only keeps what's left over when you die. So I'll let that sink in for a second. <laughs> I think giving to charity might be cooler than giving it to the IRS. So. The last one is tax arbitrage. I'll just share one tax arbitrage strategy because they're a little bit more complicated and I want you to be very careful if anyone ever tells you about them because there are some that are legit and a lot that are not, okay? So I got a little caveat there. Solar credits would be an example. Um, other examples could be film credits. Other examples could be easements. Like if you owned your, a, a property that had a bunch of land on it and you wanna pass that on for generations to come, you can do what's called a conservation easement, where you say, we're never gonna develop that property, we're gonna preserve that land, and you get a major tax credit for that. Or let's say that you buy a historical building, and you say, we're never gonna tear it down, we love this historical building, you can donate the historical facade as an easement and get major tax deductions. I know we're getting in the, the weeds here a little bit, but you know who determines what that is? Is the Forest Service, of all things. Forest Service goes, yeah, we like that, a historical easement, let's give you this tax deduction. So. Like, those are tax arbitrage. I'll just give you the simplest one that I've ever done. I bought a building years ago, and my attorney came through the building, and as he walked through, he goes, man, a lot of white walls here. Are you gonna do anything, put any pictures up on the walls? I'm like, can we just enjoy that I just finished the building? And he's like, no, I actually set it for a reason. You can actually buy artwork, and after you've owned the artwork for three years, you can donate it for the full appraised value, but you could buy it at a discount if you agree to never sell it on the open market. And I was like, tell me more. So he got me to one of these artists that I said, I'm gonna buy a collection from you at a major discount, 25 cents on the dollar, because these are things that's hard for them to sell individually. I then demonstrate it in the building for three years, and then I donate it to museums after three years, and I get $2 back for every dollar I spent. That's tax arbitrage. I, thank you. So look, this is win than play. This is putting more cash in your pocket today. That's just the IRS piece, that's just tax. And there's people from different countries here, still use the framework, build the team, see what deductions you can have, and find out what attorneys can help you structure it properly. I had people from Canada that heard me speak, they saved 100,000, it was their team that did it, they just used the framework, right? I've had people in the UK say, oh, this works, but that doesn't, I know, it's different for everyone, but the framework works. It simplifies a complex, usually boring topic. Some people love it. Most people don't.
So I grew my hair long so you can enjoy it more. It's just for you.